<laughs> I'm back. <laughs> After a month long retreat, I'm back. Man, uh, there's a lot to share. Uh, I had a lot of amazing experiences. I spent a lot of time integrating and mulling over the things that I've experienced, and I want to share some of those with you. This is going to be very kind of raw, off the cuff, intimate episode. Uh, it's tricky to talk about some of these things, you see. I struggle. I struggle. It's a real struggle <laughs> to communicate some of this levels of consciousness, some of these levels of consciousness that I've uh, that I've experienced. But anyways, here we go. Uh, before we get into it, though, I do need to issue a, a disclaimer here, which is that I'm going to be talking about some radical stuff. Uh, I'm talking about stuff now that I don't know how many humans on the planet have ever experienced. I'm sure some have, but this is not well-known stuff, even within spiritual circles. And I might be saying some things here which contradict any kind of spiritual teacher or master that you've heard teach you about enlightenment or awakening and what these things are and about consciousness and what consciousness is capable of and about psychedelics and other such things. So just keep that in mind. Um, these were outrageous experiments in consciousness. <laughs> That's what they were. And I, I just want to be authentic and, and, and true to my experiences. Um, and man, these experiences were so profound and paradigm shattering that I'm still reeling from them to some degree and still trying to wrap my mind around them and trying to understand their full implications. The reason that it took me a while after my 30 day retreat to kind of come back and start to shoot videos again is because I needed that time to integrate. I took a few weeks off just to decompress and to integrate and to come back into normal life uh, because, because man, <laughs> this was some crazy stuff. So anyways, uh, what happened? So what I decided to do from the very outset with my retreat in March, I basically decided to do 30 days of isolation which was very convenient because most of us had to stay at home anyways with these uh, virus stay at home orders. But I began my stay at home journey a little earlier than most of you uh, on the 1st of March. And my intention from the very beginning was not to meditate because I've done plenty of meditation retreats in years past. I wanted to do something new. And what I really wanted to do was I wanted to go balls to the wall with psychedelics and to see how deep could I go, what was the potential? This was the experiment. And I was going to use 5-MeO-DMT. And my plan was, because of a, a recent awakening that I had before I began this retreat, which is kind of where the idea for the retreat came from, uh, I guess this was late February, I, I had a, a few profound awakenings with 5-MeO, more profound than usual. <laughs> and and what, what was sort of shown to me or previewed in those awakenings was that there's a much deeper level that I could reach. And, and like I said in my video that I released before I left, is that th these were levels of awakening that I don't know, I don't know how many spiritual teachers or masters have had these levels of awakening. I, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm quite skeptical that any of them or that many of them have had it. I'm sure some have. I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal. I'm not trying to make myself better. It, uh, it, to me, because see, the problem here is that some spiritual people listen to this and they say, oh, well, Leo, Leo's just doing some uh, spiritual ego trip where he wants to like, he wants to be the best or the highest or like he wants some level of awakening that's beyond everybody else and this is just pure egotism. It's not about that. To me, what it's about is it's not about being better than any teacher. It's just about truth. If you care about truth, if you care about understanding reality, then that's what you care about. That's what you're passionate about. And it's not about 
one-upping somebody else. It's just, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a very pragmatic, serious question at the heart of, a, of your spiritual journey, if you really care about truth, which is, what's the highest level of truth? How do you know you've reached the highest level? This is a really tricky question. It's very, very problematic because the way that most spiritual seekers approach spirituality is that they find some teacher or guru or teaching or school which they respect and they believe in and they put all of their chips in that basket and they just blindly believe that whatever that teaching says is the highest level is where they stop. And that's where they stop. And of course, most people never even reach that level of whatever the teacher or guru or school talks about. Most people never get there. But even the, some of those few who do get to the top, they just assume that, well, that's it. We're done. And they never bother to, to wonder more deeply, like, well, how do we really know that this is the top? How do we know there's not something, something deeper? How would you know? Because you're just trusting other humans. You're trusting scriptures, you're trusting books, you're trusting videos. But if there's one thing that awakening should teach you, even if you have a little degree of it, not to mention the higher degrees of it that are possible, even a little degree of it, what it should teach you is that you can't trust humans. You can't trust language. You can't trust belief. You can't trust books. And you can't really trust gurus or spiritual teachers. Because you don't know. I'm not saying that they're liars or that they're frauds. I'm just saying that they might have reached their limit. But their limit might not be the ultimate limit. So it's from this perspective. Please understand that it's from this perspective that... I'm doing various experiments and I'm trying out lots of different stuff. My spiritual journey would be a lot more direct and simple and less confusing and honestly would have a lot less suffering in it if I just selected one school, one teacher, bowed down to him and just said, okay, what you're saying is the ultimate truth. Let me just now do it and reach it and then not ask any more questions. That would be so much easier. <laughs> Uh, so instead, what I'm doing is I'm doing the only thing you you could do if you were truly interested in truth is you got to go it all by yourself. You have to forget all the teachers, all the teachings, all the scriptures, and you got to go it all alone and to just to see what comes up for you. So that's what I did. My intention was to do 30 days of back-to-back -back trips of 5-MeO DMT at gradually increasing doses. 30 trips total, one per day, over the month of March. And that's exactly what I did. So what happened? <laughs> this is where it gets difficult, because I'm going to be using terms, and I'm going to be saying things that I might have said in the past, or that other spiritual teachers that you respect and love and have studied have said. Uh, some of these are classical things. I'm going to be talking about God, and I'm going to be talking about love, and I'm going to be talking about consciousness, and enlightenment, and awakening, and yada, yada, yada. Um, but you have to understand, <laughs> there's so many degrees and levels to it. That's the most mind-blowing part about this whole thing. So I'm going to be doing my best to try to communicate the difference in, in degree of what God really is, because we're, we're talking about God here. We're talking about you. We're talking about the, the self, the ultimate self. We're talking about love, but many, many degrees. All right, many, many degrees. And, uh, and I honestly, the levels of awakening that I reached within 50, just within just a week, Actually, yeah, within just a week of doing this experiment, I reached levels of consciousness that were so profound that I started writing a manifesto 
basically denying the awakenings of every single spiritual teacher that you've ever heard of. That's how profound my awakenings got. It, becomes, it became just completely transparent to me that most people who think they're awake or teach awakening aren't actually awake. In fact, they're so not awake that I wouldn't even give them 1% awakening. That's what we're talking about here. But I was also very careful about this because I started writing this manifesto, but then I, I also had a lot of doubt because, you know, first of all, I don't want to disrespect any teachers. Most of these teachers uh, are great teachers. They're doing a, a very good service to mankind for teaching what they teach. These are some of the most conscious humans on the planet. I respect many of these teachers. Um, and so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to throw doubts on their teachings. I don't want to be some asshole um, who does that. Uh, but at the same time, I have to be honest to my experiences and my awakenings. And that's what my awakenings were showing me. Uh, in the end, I didn't end up publishing this manifesto. I was going to do a whole video on it. Uh, because I, I don't want to be confrontational about it. And I don't want to, I don't want to start a non-duality war. Um, so instead what I decided to do is not to do that manifesto, but just to, just to share what actually happened. And then you, you make up your own mind and you make of it what you will. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time comparing myself to other teachers. Uh, the only thing that I'll tell you is how do you really know? If there are many degrees of awakening, which there are, how do you really know what level your teacher or school is at? How do you know? You're just assuming. You don't really know. So just recognize that. And then from that place of not knowing, your mind can be open to new possibilities. Maybe possibilities that your teachers or gurus haven't reached. Or maybe they have, and then you'll discover that they have by reaching that level yourself. See, unless you've had some really profound awakenings, you're in no position to evaluate the level of awakening of any teacher or school or teaching. So let me sort of back up and start from the beginning. Um, Already, when I went into this retreat, I already was sort of expecting that this was going to happen. So one of the reasons for the retreat and for this 30-day experiment was that I really wanted to, to demonstrate to myself whether these intuitions that I had about deeper and deeper levels of awakening that are possible that have not been realized by many enlightened masters, I wanted to, to really verify for myself that this is the case and that I wasn't just tricking myself. Because, you know, it is easy to get into a sort of a spiritual ego trip where you want to be better than other teachers and so forth. And so I, I, I wanted to really test against that. So I sort of held myself back and I said, okay, I'm going to do these, this 30-day um, retreat. I'm going to really test over these 30 days and just really see is this really true what my intuition is showing me? And so that's what I started. And then at first I started slow with relatively low doses of 5-MeO and I just kept uh, ramping it up every single day. Like I said, by about the seventh day, I was already at the level where it became completely clear that I was experiencing levels of awakening beyond stuff that I've read or heard of from teachers. Um, which again, it's not to say that there aren't any humans on earth who have reached these levels. I'm sure there are. Part of the challenge is how do you communicate this difference in depth? Um, and probably the most awakened and enlightened people, they don't even teach. They don't even create videos. They're not on YouTube. They don't write books. They're probably living in a hut somewhere in the forest or whatever, minding their own business or they've even left the planet <laughs> because they're so awake. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, that was about by, by, the fir by the end of the first week, seven days, I got to that point. I remember the, my, my first really profound awakening was that I really, by maybe the fifth or seventh day, 
I, I really hit into what God is. Like, really, like, really, 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 what is God? <laughs> like, really, what is God? I think that most awakened, so-called awakened people, especially some of these neo advaitin types and some of these um, modern Zen teachers and modern, modern sort of Buddhist teachers and so forth, um, like Shenzhen Young and others like this, they, they I mean... They're wonderful teachers. That that's one of the that's what breaks my heart about this is that I don't want to say anything bad about these teachers. They're wonderful teachers, but I I can't seriously consider these people awake. I mean, they don't they don't understand what God is. <laughs> it's just that simple. They don't understand what God is, and I I totally empathize with that because I've had so many awakenings into the nature of God by this point. Um, not even in this retreat, m much prior for, for years now that, you know, I thought I understood what God was <laughs> and I did. It's just that at low levels, that's the amazing thing about God. You, you understand it at deeper and deeper and deeper levels. And if, if your spiritual teaching is, is merely teaching you something like cessation or nothingness, or emptiness, which is very common with the many Buddhist teachings, um, or even the self, or even that you're nothing and that you're everything. I mean, yeah, of course, all of that is true. I'm not contradicting any of that per se. I'm basically in agreement with most teachers. It's just a question of how deep does it go. Uh, but but these sort of teachings of emptiness, they they're fine, they're good, they're important, they're necessary even, and you should you should realize what emptiness is and all that. But uh, but really, really, if you if you really want to understand, like you have to really want to understand. Do you really want to understand what reality is? Because I get the sense from many people who do spiritual work and many even so-called enlightened masters and so forth that. They don't really care about understanding reality. Maybe they care about escaping suffering. Maybe they care about peace. Maybe they care about emptiness. But they don't really care about understanding reality. Now you might say, oh, Leo, but that, that's just a function of the mind. Understanding is just what the mind is doing. Enlightenment is beyond that. <laughs> no, consciousness is capable of infinite understanding. God is capable of infinite self-understanding. You are capable of completely understanding reality, if you want. You're capable of that. Now, maybe you'll, you'll need to take some 5-MeO to do it. That, that would certainly help a lot. Um, I don't know if you're going to be capable of it through meditation or something, but with 5-MeO, you're certainly capable of it. So... So what happened to me was that I, I completely, <laughs> I completely understood what God is, what reality is. It has no beginning and no end. It has no up. It has no down. Every point of reality can be taken as its beginning or as its end. You can look at reality. If you imagine this room that I'm sitting in right now, and you might say, well, where did this room come from? Well, it came from the past, you can kind of think like, well, maybe 20 years ago, somebody built this room. And then before that, it was just like some other building was here. And before that, it was just some empty land. And before that, there was trees. And before that, there was like dinosaurs that roamed the earth on this plot of land or something like this, right? This is how your mind sort of imagines where this room came from. Um, and then you can also kind of project into the future where you can say like, well, Maybe in a hundred years, this building will be demolished. Something else will be built here. Maybe it'll be a park. Maybe it'll be a skyscraper or whatever. And then even after that, something else will happen. The earth will explode or whatever. And then there will be nothing here at all. It'll just be the vacuum of these space, whatever. Um, but really, so what you're doing is you're sort of like taking reality and sort of looking at it in a sort of a linear fashion, like from the past to the future and then the present is sort of here, right? But really what God is, when you're in full God consciousness, you look around the room and you can see it from every single, from an infinite number of angles and perspectives. You see that 
every part of the room generates and manufactures and creates every other part. So normally, we sort of, as humans, we sort of think like, well, the Big Bang is sort of the origin point of our universe, and then from there came the Earth, and then from the Earth, on the Earth, other stuff happened, and then ultimately that's why we're here. You're sort of looking at it in a single dimension. You're looking at what reality is. Whereas here, when you're in God consciousness, you see it from every single possible dimension and angle. It's not happening linearly through, you know, past, present, future. It's all in the present now, and you can see it from every possible angle, almost as though if you take a watermelon and you do a cross-section with a giant knife through that watermelon, and you just keep doing cross-section, cross-section, cross-section in various different angles, eventually you'll slice it up into an infinite number of, of perspectives like that. And then you will understand the entire watermelon as a sort of a whole, whereas usually as humans, what we do is we're slicing that watermelon just right down the middle like this. We just slice right through it, and that's the cross-section that we see. And that cross-section is what re represents sort of conventional human history and future and time and how we situate ourselves within reality. So that was, that was, that, that one was really deep, that awakening. Um, but that was only like day five or seven. And then I started going even deeper. <laughs> what happened then? Mm, uh, more, just deeper and deeper insight into the nature of what God is. I remember there was one trip where I woke so deep and I was just so amazed looking at the room and everything within it that I ran to just like look at my computer just to see to see what a computer is. <laughs> You're not conscious of what a computer is. And it was just so incredible to be like using the mouse just to click on the screen and just to see the computer because the computer is my own imagination. And I was conscious of how I was imagining all the circuitry in the computer. I was conscious of how I was imagining the entire internet. Um, I was conscious of how I was, I was imagining the entire email system. So when I send an email to somebody, that email gets delivered. Then I, I get an email back from that person, you know, a day later or something. So I was conscious of how, that how, how my mind is generating that entire thing, how it's being held in my consciousness. Um, and so literally what became possible is I break, I broke through into, into, into what I'm calling telepathy. This was something new that I had not experienced ever before in my trips or awakenings. What happened, and now I understand telepathy, how it works, is what happened is that I became so conscious that I realized what consciousness is, is it's an infinitely interconnected, self-communicating field. Every part of consciousness, if you take this, this chunk of consciousness right here, and this chunk of consciousness right here, right now, under normal human conditions, in your sober, quote-unquote, sober state, these two pieces of consciousness right here are not really connecting or communicating with each other. I mean, they're connecting, but they're not communicating. They're not in communication. But as you become more conscious, what happens is that every, every point in space interconnects with itself and starts to communicate with itself. This is really a profound, shocking, mystical experience. Uh, And, and it, it keeps getting cranked up more and more and more. You could call it omniscience or you could call it telepathy, but really what happens is that it's sort of like the universal communication system gets turned on for the first time. Right now, your conscious field that you're, this is your conscious field right here. Right now, your conscious field is not in infinite communication with itself. It's fragmented and divided such that you think that, 
I'm over here, you're over there, my computer's over here, your computer's over there, my email account's over here, your email account's over there, and if you want to communicate with me, you got to like send me an email, I got to wait, receive it through some electronic wires and signals that run around the earth, it comes to me, then I got to open it, I got to read it, I got to process it, then I got to respond, it has to come back to you through more wires, and then you read it, and then in this way, we're communicating. You can, you can tell this process is extremely indirect. Why is it not possible that you and I communicate directly right now? Directly. If you realize that you are me and I am you, this opens up a radical possibility of instant communication, which means that actually what's happening, and I encourage you to try to become conscious of this a little bit right now if you can, but actually, even though it seems like this is a video or an audio, if you're listening to this as an audio, and it seems like this is going through your computer, which means it's going through YouTube or through some server, and it's going through a bunch of wires around the earth to reach you, which is happening in time. It seems as though I recorded this, this video days or weeks ago, and now you're watching it. Maybe years have passed since I recorded this and you're watching it for the first time and you're hearing this for the first time and it might seem to you that, that that's just what this is and this is your computer that's projecting these sounds out to you and all of that is indirect. But you can become directly conscious right now that actually you are communicating directly with yourself. Telepathy is happening right now. And all that other shit you're just imagining. You're imagining computers and you're imagining wires running around the earth. All of this is just your denial of the fact that you are talking to yourself right now. <laughs> you see, you need a story to deny that you are infinite consciousness and that you are me. So to create the separation between me and you so that you can believe that you're alive as a human, and so that you have a convincing story that you're not God, uh, you have imagined all of these barriers. So you think that for you to communicate with me, you got to turn on a computer, you got to look at your email, you got to write me a letter, you got to call me on the phone. <laughs> None of this is necessary. You can communicate with me anytime, as long as you're conscious enough of what you are and what I am. Now, of course, even though I tell you all this, the problem is that you're in such a low state of consciousness right now that you're incapable of telepathically communicating with me. And honestly, so am I. Right now, I'm not in a telepathic state of consciousness. I need to be much more conscious right now in order to do that. But at least I understand that it's possible because I've done it. You see... So telepathy, it's, here's the amazing thing about telepathy. What it really is, is simply, it's so simple. You're talking to yourself. That's all it is. You're not actually talking to me because I'm just imaginary from your point of view. So really, all the telepathy is, is to realize so deeply that you are the self and that you are the only thing that exists. And you, your consciousness becomes so infinitely interconnected with itself that you are able to actually take my voice, take my face, take the image of me in your mind, and you're able to communicate with me directly because you're communicating with yourself. That's all it is. It becomes instant communication. Pretty amazing, huh? Imagine, imagine the following possibility. Imagine you could become so conscious that your consciousness could become so interconnected with itself that whatever abilities or skills you think I have, you could just instantly download for yourself. So you think that maybe I spent many years studying personal development, experimenting with psychedelics, learning about life, 
developing skills. And maybe you think, oh, I want to be like Leo. I want I want some of those skills. But I would have to like go and train and do stuff and do all the hard work he's done. Yeah, that that's if you're doing it the traditional way. Or maybe what you could do is you can become so fucking conscious that you're me and you can just download every single one of my lessons and experiences and skills just instantly into your mind. Now, I'm just planting that seed. I'm not saying you can go off and just smoke some 5-MeO and do this. <laughs> it's not so simple. Because you might wonder, well, Leo, if that's possible, how come you didn't do it? Why don't you just take like Kobe Bryant, connect to him and steal all of his skills and then go show us how good you are at basketball? Um, and that that is literally what I'm saying you can possibly do. I'm not saying I've I've fully succeeded in doing that. I'm saying that I'm just, I'm starting to open my mind to these possibilities through these radical degrees of consciousness that I've had. These are interesting possibilities, but I, I'm nowhere near the end of them, right? But open your mind to, to such a possibility. Ask yourself this, why wouldn't that be possible? You'd say, oh, well, that, that violates the laws of physics. That's impossible. People need to spend decades practicing and doing this and that and there's the brain you know you can't just you can't just stuff skills into the brain through downloads this is some sort of science fiction nonsense but you're imagining all those limits you see it's true for you that you're under all these limits precisely because you're imagining all these limits and furthermore you don't know how to unimagine all of these limits and hey I'm with you. I have many limits as well that I can't easily unimagine. I'm talking about radical peak states of consciousness that I can't sustain. I'm not sitting here in this God mode level of consciousness right now. And this is where a lot of spiritual teachers, where I disagree with a lot of spiritual teachers, because a lot of spiritual teachers will say, oh, well, if it was just some temporary peak experience, that means it wasn't real consciousness, it wasn't real enlightenment, because real enlightenment is constant. And I disagree. I highly disagree. You can have mild versions of enlightenment and awakening that is constant, but you can't have what I've experienced constantly. What I'm talking about now is degrees of consciousness that are so radical that you can barely walk. You can barely talk. You can barely eat from this state. It's so much consciousness. It's so much consciousness, it leaves you gasping for breath. Uh, it leaves you in tears. It leaves you with your, with your jaw dropped on the floor. It leaves you plastered on the floor. That's how much consciousness we're talking about. This ain't something you're going to meditate your way to. Unless maybe you devote 40 years of your life to nonstop meditation. And even then... I still don't really, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Because I, I, I've i interacted, man, I've interacted with many Zen teachers, uh, Buddhist teachers, teacher, teachers who have taught and practiced Vipassana for, for 40 fucking years. And I know for a fact that they have not reached these levels of consciousness. I know for a fact that they have not reached these levels of consciousness. And they do this professionally for 30 or 40 years. So what chance do you have? Look, maybe you do. You're welcome to disprove me. If you're an exceptional individual, maybe you're born with some spiritual talents, maybe because you've had good past lives or whatever, um, you're able to do it. But the average person, even the average spiritual seeker, never, never, not in a, in a thousand years. Not possible. You're not going to do it. I'm talking about superhuman levels of consciousness. These are not levels of consciousness that you can access sober. You need to literally change the neurotransmitters, upgrade the neurotransmitters in your imaginary brain. And yes, your brain is still imaginary. <laughs> and yes, those neurotransmitters are still imaginary. But you still need to upgrade them, nevertheless, in order to access some of the things that I'm saying. 
Now, how you upgrade them, that's 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 an open question. Maybe you upgrade them through 5MEO, maybe you upgrade them through LSD, maybe you upgrade them through doing intense yoga or some sort of Wim Hof method breathing, crazy breathing, where you do, you know, this shamanic breathing for for hours and hours and hours and years and years and years, and eventually you break through. Maybe, I don't know. I can't test all the methods. There's too, methods, too many methods to test. Maybe you fast for 40 days, Jesus style, in the desert. Go on some massive, you know, vision quest where you don't drink and, and eat, and then you're half on the brink of death, and then you, you break through. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know, you know, what all the possibilities are. But uh, I just want to make you aware that there are these superhuman states of consciousness, which many spiritual teachers don't recognize. The reason they don't recognize them because they can't sustain them. <laughs> you, in many cases, you can't naturally arrive at these at these at these degrees of consciousness. You're not going to do it through some simple self inquiry. You're not just going to sit there, Rupert Spira style, and just kind of question. Oh, yeah, this is the present moment. Just be in the present moment, Eckhart Tolle style. Like, yeah, just be in the present moment. This is not going to do it. This is, you're not going to become fucking infinitely telepathic through this sort of process. It's not going to work. No direct pointing method, you know, no self-inquiry. Like, who am I? Who am I? This is not, it's not going to work. I've seen people do self-inquiry for weeks at intensives. These fucking people ain't awake. I don't consider these people awake. I don't consider the people who lead these self-inquiry intensives to really be fully awake. It's a joke. They don't fucking understand what God is. I've interacted with these people. I've interviewed these people. I've invited these people to my home. I've tripped with these people. They're not awake. They're not awake at the level that I'm talking about. And they have a lot of good excuses. In many cases, they don't want to do 5-MeO DMT. <laughs> For a good reason. Because it would it would shatter all all of their all of their illusions about awakening. So, anyways, we're just getting started here. <laughs> this is just the beginning of of the stuff that I experienced. So let me sort of speed up because there's a lot more to to say, and we're already forty minutes into this thing. So, uh, what happened next? So I told you about the telepathy thing. Oh yeah. So I guess I got to tell you about this sort of awkward moment is while I was on my computer, you know, like I, I was just so amazed by everything. When you're in this massive state of consciousness, you're just so amazed by everything because everything looks brand new to you. It looks like pure magic. So I went to my computer and uh, it's interesting because lately what I started to do is I started to collect, I mean, I've, I've watched porn my whole life and I've collected porn my whole life, of course, like most guys. Um, uh, but lately, like in the last couple of months, there was something about like I started just to to it wasn't just porn. It was like I wanted the most beautiful pictures of naked female bodies that I could find on the Internet. So I started looking around for those and just amassing a collection. <laughs> I know I'm I'm dirty. Um, but anyways, uh, maybe, maybe you can empathize with me <laughs> if you're, if you're a horny guy like me. So I started doing this, um, of course, partially for just, uh, <laughs> horniness reasons, but also partially because just for, you know, there's, there's different as aspects to, to this. There's just the raw horniness, but then there's also the aesthetic aspect. And this is actually the more spiritual aspect. It's like, you're looking as a man, you're looking at this incredible just like top one percent of one percent of one percent of female bodies and like it's just like it's fucking beautiful it's just beautiful um and so anyways yeah so i started building up a little collection of this stuff um but so i, I just i went and now i clicked on this folder with these images on it um while I was in my infinite consciousness, God mode state. And, and I look at it and I'm just, I'm utterly floored. I'm just like this, it's like, <laughs> how do you communicate so much beauty? <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> I 
But yet. <laughs> yeah, I just look at it and it brings me to tears. Because I'm looking at it and <laughs> I'm looking at myself. I'm looking at myself. I'm looking at how I create I created all I imagined all of these beautiful bodies. It's utterly profound. Yeah, it's like yeah, you've never you've never really seen porn <laughs> until you've seen it on 5 and Mio DMT. Until you recognize that it's you. So so I took I took this I took this I actually I loaded it on my laptop. I took the laptop and uh, I, I, I brought it into the bathroom and I actually, I also started taking baths. So this, I sort of got to back up one step to make this make sense. Somewhere in, in like the first five, five Mio trips, I started, I, I kind of discovered this method of like, uh, I guess the trips opened me up, the awakenings opened me up. And I become more self-accepting and more kind to myself and to my body. And this is part of the healing, the spiritual healing work is really you start to realize just how much you mistreat your body, how unkind and ungrateful you are to your body. So as I realized that, I started, I started, I said, okay, so what can I do? What can I do to love my body more, to be more kind to my body? What does my body want? And my body said it wants, it wants warmth. We're just coming out of winter. It's still still cold here where I live at times because I live in the desert. It's cold at night. So my body was craving warmth. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? And so they're like, oh yeah, go, go run a bath. So that's what I did right in the middle of my trips. I would run a bath, hot bath, like a piping hot bath. And then I would just soak in it and I would just complete my trip in the bath such that I would do like, I would, uh, I would start my trip never in the bath. I would, I would wait for about, 15 minutes for the full effect of the trip to come on and then when i was right in the peak of the awakening that's when i would go run the bath and jump in the bath and so i basically did that for the remainder of the whole month so most of my tripping was actually done in the, in the bathroom in a bathtub of course it was done safely um the bathtub doesn't have that much water in it so i'm not going to drown in or anything uh i do recommend you be very careful though like if, if you were planning to do this in a pool or in a jacuzzi, like a hot tub, which is actually quite deep, you could drown in it in, if you lose consciousness. Um, personally, I've never lost consciousness on 5 Um, but some people do white out if you take a high enough dose. So just be careful. Don't be stupid. Um, I'm doing this with a lot of experience. You got to understand that I, I've done hundreds of trips at this point. So I, I've done... A lot of it, and I'm very safe with my protocols. I don't do reckless stuff. So this this whole bathtub situation, it might seem like it's dangerous. It's not dangerous at all. Uh, very, very safe. So anyways, I spent a lot of time tripping there. So I take my laptop with the beautiful porn images. I, I place it uh, I place it there by my bathtub, and I just soak in the bathtub, and I just admire it. And I just have this incredible awakening where I completely surrender in that bathtub. And I'm just, I'm just surrendering to infinite God consciousness as I'm looking at this computer monitor, realizing that I'm imagining the entire fucking computer, all of its microchips, all of its circuitry, all of its electronics, all of that then goes into creating the pixels that are now displaying images of, of these beautiful women. And I'm looking at it and I'm realizing that it's all me. Absolutely all of it is me. And that the only thing I'm jerking off to is myself. And I have a profound insight into the nature of what desire is. Desire is desire for oneself. But as a human, we're in your sort of ordinary human level of consciousness, like, like you are right now, your desire is fragmented and biased. So there's, as a function of your survival, in order for your body to be able to survive, you have to desire certain things and not other things. And so this, this becomes not only desire for food and for sex and for 
certain types of warm situations or cold situations, the temperature, you know, range. Humans are very sensitive. We're, we're very sensitive, fragile organisms. We need everything to be just perfect for us to live and for us to be in comfort and to be happy ordinarily. Um, but infinite God consciousness isn't limited by any of this. And so it is, it desires itself infinitely, completely, totally, without any bias. So as a function of being an organism and, and surviving, you need to have biases. Your consciousness needs to have biases as to what you prefer. For example, I have naked pictures of, of women on my computer, but not men. Why is that? That's a bias. There's no, there's no absolute existential reason for why that is. Because there's actually absolutely no difference between a naked man and a naked woman. Also, why do I have images of the most beautiful women? Why don't I have images of, of old, wrinkled women on my computer? For the same reason, <laughs> because of course I have biases. I'm biased towards young, beautiful, you know, supermodel women. Of course, every guy is. How could you not be? The and why is that? Well, just that's, that's just thousands and millions of years of evolution. And as a female, you're you're biased to a certain type of man. But when your consciousness becomes infinite, those biases. Those des I call these, this is the bias of, of human desire. The bias of desire sort of dissolves and you realize desire in a sort of absolute form, which is just desire for being yourself, the desire for absolute truth, the desire for God, the desire for, for everything. Imagine desiring everything as much as you desire the most desirable thing that you've ever desired. That's God's desire. That's love. Now we're getting into infinite love territory. And so I was looking at this computer screen and just completely blown away and just completely conscious <laughs> that all of my desire for my entire life has just been desire of my own self, my true self, the love of God, the God self. So in a sense, all of your desire is, is really is a perversion of the desire for God. When you desire pussy, really what you desire is God. When you desire a husband, really what you desire is God. When you desire children, you really just desire God. And you get God. You get God in that limited form. If you desire pussy, you get God in the form of a pussy. If you desire a husband, you get God in the form of a husband. And if you desire children, you get God in the form of children. And you see God in that thing that you desire. If you really desire it, you see God in that pussy. You see God in that husband. You see God in that, child, in that child. And that's what makes you fall in love with it. Ta-da! But your love is still so limited because it's constrained to that one particular limited formulation of God. As soon as we change the shape of that pussy, you no longer desire it. You no longer love it. As soon as we change your husband, you no longer, longer love him. You know, he starts to beat you, you don't love him anymore. Your child starts acting like an asshole, you don't love your child anymore. That's how it works. Why is that? Because you're still constrained by the, all the survival demands of, of being this finite, fragile organism. But when you're an infinite God consciousness, you have none of those limitations, and so you love everything. And for the first time, your desire, all of your desires, they get fully quenched and fulfilled. They don't really get quenched, they get fulfilled in infinite completion. Your desires really get complete. And so by this point in my tripping, I, I got to about maybe, this is maybe the two week mark, halfway there, about 14 days worth. Uh, I kept doing these, these, these trips every, every night and then kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. 
And now what started was the real breakthrough into the, the real heart of what awakening is. All of that that I just described, all of that was just a prelude to true awakening, which is the discovery of love. That's real awakening is love. And of course, there's so many degrees of love. So now we got to talk about that. Of course, I've awoken to love many times before, but now by the two week mark, now the love really started to crack open. Like, oh man, how do you describe the love? Just in infinite self love, you're drowning in this love. Yeah, I remember I was in that bathtub, just just completely drowning in the love of God. So much so, mm, by this point, I had developed an actual verbal uh, telepathic communication with with God. So when I when I talk about telepathy, you might start to know wonder well. Leah, who were you telepathic with? Uh, it's not per se who, it's really with myself. It's with whatever aspect of my mind that I want, and ultimately since I am God and since I'm talking to myself, I'm doing telepathy with myself. So, so basically, in my awakening journey at some point around the two-week mark, um, I became so telepathic, my consciousness became so infinitely in communication with itself, that I started sort of a, a series of just conversation, like literally a dialogue, English language dialogue with God. You might wonder, how is that possible? Well, you just imagine it and there it is. You might say, well, you're just hallucinating it. Of course, <laughs> you're hallucinating everything. <laughs> That's the point. You get past all that. You might say, well, why do you need a communication with God? Well, you don't really need it. It's just whatever, whatever's helpful for you. You see, God will take whatever images or language or symbols you want and communicate to you through that. Why? Because that's what you understand. That's what works for you. So if you're an English speaker, God will speak to you in English. If you're a German, God will speak to you in German. If you're Chinese, God will speak to you in Chinese. If you're a Christian, God will maybe show up in the form of Jesus. If you're a Buddhist, maybe Buddha or one of his avatars or something. And if you're a Hindu, then it'll show up as some Hindu avatar. It's all completely relative. It's all completely imaginary. It doesn't matter which form it takes. It can take any form it wants. Um, and all you're doing is you're just imagining it. So anyways, I was just having an English language con basically conversation with God. And so what started happening was that God was starting, sort of starting to guide me into a, a deeper levels of, of, of self-love. So what starts to happen is that the love becomes so big that you're, you're not able to hold it. Your body and your mind is not able to tolerate it. It's too much. To tolerate the deepest levels of love, you have to purify yourself and let, go through a, a sort of a spiritual catharsis letting go process which I started going through and so the intelligence of of your mind and just the awakening process the intelligence of it all it will it will just it will smoothly and intuitively take you to through the process of the purification that's necessary for you to reach the deeper levels of love if you want of course you're always welcome to resist and to, to deny God's love and you'll fall back. You have to be really willing to push yourself. And by the way, as a little aside here, just in case some of you misunderstand, um, I really had to push myself to do this 5-MeO DMT for 30 days straight. After a few weeks, I didn't want to do anymore. Like every single day I had to force myself to do it 
This is not something like you imagine, maybe if you've never done psychedelic, you might imagine, oh, it's so pleasurable, it's sort of like shooting heroin into your veins, and it's just pure pleasure, and it's just an escape from real spiritual work, and it's uh, it's just addictive, and now he's addicted to it, and no, no, it's the opposite of addiction. You stop wanting to do it. If you have to push yourself to do it. This is a journey towards truth and love, and your ego doesn't want it in many cases. Now, of course, there's a lot of pleasure to it as well once you surrender, assuming you do surrender, but hey, many of you don't want to surrender, so it might not be so pleasurable for you. When I describe how, how wonderful it is for me, you have to understand that's because I've done an enormous amount of work with psychedelics and without psychedelics. I've done a lot of purification and purging. I've had very difficult trips in the past. Some of the trips I'm about to explain are some of the most difficult ones I've ever had. We haven't gotten to that yet. Um, so it's, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. This is difficult fucking work. This is years of spiritual work condensed into a single day, into a single hour, into a single week or month. It might take you 10 years to, to do this much emotional purging and, and purifying if you're just meditating normally. So anyways, uh, I sort of developed this telepathic instant communication with God. And I just, I just started getting guidance for what I needed to do to go deeper. And so God sort of started to guide me and it was, it was very helpful. Now you might say, well, Leo, but, but how is God guiding you? If you're conscious that you're everything and that you're God, then what, what does it mean for God to then be guiding you? Isn't that a duality? Because there's like a, you know, a self and an other. Yes, of course it's a duality. It's just a sort of a, a training wheels, right? It's training wheels. Uh, you don't need to imagine God speaking to you. You could just be God by yourself in silence directly. That's fine too. But a lot of times it's helpful because our human mind is sort of conditioned to, to have a sense of other and then to have others you know, teach us and help us and guide us especially when you feel weak or you feel like you've hit upon some realization. Sometimes when you're tripping, you hit upon some realization that's so profound and epic that you don't feel like you can handle it. You sort of shrivel back down into your little child self. You almost like become a baby asking for mommy to cuddle you and to, to soothe you as you're sucking your thumb in a fetal position, trying to integrate this epic insight as it's skull fucking you you see and so one of the one of the amazing things about god if you really break through into a communication with god is just how accepting and forgiving it is god is never going to judge you because God knows that it's you <laughs> and that it's love and that it loves you. So any of your weaknesses or any of your egotism, any of your evil, any of your devilry, God totally understands and totally accepts. And it will, it will help you to accept it too. And in fact, that's one of the biggest things that God can offer you is to heal you of your own self-hatred and self-judgment and self-denial. Everything you don't accept about yourself, every little freckle on your face that you don't like, that you want removed, every little stray hair that you have that's growing in the wrong area that you don't think is pretty, all the mistakes you've done in, in, in your life, all the regrets you have, all the people you've wronged, all the wicked, selfish shit you've done, all of that, God is conscious of, God completely understands, God completely accepts, and completely loves. And that's one of the greatest gifts that God can give to you, is to share that level of acceptance with you.
So that's what started happening to me as I was in that bathtub over a period of, of multiple days, multiple awakenings. I just started to accept myself and love myself at, at ever, ever deeper levels. And the more I loved and accepted myself and forgave myself, uh, the more the next day, in the next trip, I would even open up to deeper levels of love. And it just kept getting deeper and deeper over the course of, of several days. Uh, there was a, a couple of distinct and profound things that I that I realized. One was that I, I this was very important. I broke through and I realized what what the what really what the purpose of of reality is what the purpose of life is the purpose of life is just it's a it's a contest for who can love who more that's really what life is about when you're fully conscious when you're fully conscious life is not about earning money it's not about having kids it's not about going to work. It's not about having a great career. It's not about having a house or a car. It's not about being secure. It's not about reforming the political system. It's not about electing some progressive. It's not about saving the whales. It's not about any of that. It's only about who can love who more. And so one of the most profound realizations I've had in the last month is that love is a race. Uh, I mean, reality is a race. Consciousness is a race towards who can love whom more. That's what it is. When you're completely selfless, there's nothing else for consciousness to do but to love itself more and more and more and more. That becomes the only motivation. That becomes the only intelligent thing to do. But most humans are so far from that level of consciousness that they are completely, completely oblivious and ignorant that this is the function of life. They think life is about survival or other things. Life is only about one thing. Who can love whom more? It's just a race for love. And if you don't realize that, you're not fucking conscious. You're not awake. It's just a race for love. This race for love is existential. It's not personal. It's not a race for how one human can love another human. It has nothing to do with humans. It has nothing to do with emotions. It's just a function of what consciousness is and does. An intelligent, fully conscious consciousness would only be interested in love. It wouldn't be interested in anything else because everything else is inferior everything else is fear everything else is is it's just utter silliness it's just complete silliness everything you're doing in your life you might as well be collecting shoelaces or bottle caps that's that's how insignificant it is compared to the only thing you should be doing which is practicing love that's it so what what God started showing me is how much God loved me. And so we we sort of actually went into this sort of race. So God, I, God would love me, and then I would feel the love, and I would say, but I love you. And it would say, uh, but I love you more. And so we sort of, it, it, it became like this duel of love. And this was, this was so, so amazing. Um, it just, it just turned into this never ending duel of love. And that's basically what infinity is. It is sort of like, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you more. I love you more. I love you more. And it just, who can love who more? And whoever can love who more is God. You see?
But the problem is, is that you're not fully conscious and you're not fully God yet. You're still resisting and you're still in denial. And your capacity is still limited because you're still constrained to this human body. So I'm in this sort of duel with God. And what's happening is that God is just sort of showering me with love. But then I realize that my function here is not just to sit in this bathtub and just to accept the love and just enjoy the love as though I'm just enjoying some pleasure and just bask in it. That's not true love. True love is not receiving love. True love is giving love. True love is being love. So, of course, <laughs> the way God gets you to love is by loving you so much. And by being so hands-off, so completely not asking anything of you that 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 its love then sparks you to want to also love it back you see it turns into a a, a reciprocal uh, a reciprocal reaction where it's like two mirrors that are mirroring light between each other like a laser beam bouncing between two mirrors and it just bounces back and forth and back and forth and as it bounces it becomes more and more and more concentrated and it strengthens <laughs> And it becomes more coherent. And so that's what started happening. Uh, I got into, at first it started just like like a, little, like a little game. Like, I love you. No, I love you more. Like a little game. It sounds like it's almost like childish. And it sort of was. But then it, it morphed from just being this childish thing to this like serious existential like business. <laughs> this turned into the work. This was the true awakening, is that the two mirrors, you know, first it took a little while to get the two mirrors aligned, because, you know, if the two mirrors aren't perfectly aligned, the laser beam will kind of bounce back and forth in different directions. It's not going to, like, really concentrate. So that was happening at first. Hold on. Not the coronavirus, <laughs> just just the love. And so, so it took a while for us to set up the mirrors, and then the love started just sort of bouncing back and forth between between us, and it just kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The problem is that I'm still I'm still in the human form, so it's sort of like that's the pure love over there. That's truly infinite, and what I am over here is still finite. But I'm I'm opening it up, so I'm I'm going through this process. The, the so the love starts bouncing back and forth, and as it's bounce, bouncing back and forth, like I just I I reach every time it it you know it bounces from me to God, then from God back to me. But when it bounces back to me, it's more concentrated than it was when it bounced back from me to God. So like I say, I love you more, but God. God, but God still loves me more, and I can, I know that God loves me more than I love God. And so it just keeps bouncing like that. But each time it bounces back to me, it transforms me, opens me up deeper. But as it opens me up deeper, it also reveals blockages and obstacles to my capacity to love. Right? Because, for example, like, you get into this game with God, but then God will will ping you back with love, but this love now asks of you uh, to love all the shit that you don't love as a human. Are you willing to love the Holocaust? Are you willing to love 9-11? Are you willing to love genocide? Are you willing to love rape? Are you willing to love murder? Are you willing to love that ex-boyfriend or girlfriend who cheated on you? Are you willing to love your father who abused you? Are you willing to love your mother who criticized you your whole life and told you that you're no good and you, and she never gave you the love that you deserved? Are you willing to love the, the, the kids in school who bullied you? Are you willing to love your teacher who may, maybe raped you in gym class or molested you? Are you willing to love the, the po politicians who you hate and your political, you know, your rival political party? 
Are you willing to love Christians, Jews, Hindus, atheists, devil worshipers? How deep is your love really? You see, God is able to love all that without any hesitation. But you are not. I was not. So as it was pinging me, I had to go through sort of a rapid process of, well, either resistance to it or, or surrender and rapid, rapid integration. Because then, sort of like once it bounces to me, I got to accept it, integrate it, open to it, and then bounce it back to God. What does it mean to bounce it back to God? It means that as I embrace more of what I am, of what reality is, and I love it deeper, that is my love for God. <laughs> that is the bounce back. So it's not literally that any, no, no object, no tennis ball was bouncing back be between and forth between us. This is all happening at a sort of a, an, a very abstract high level of consciousness. And, um, but then one of the hardest things for you to love, actually, you might think that, you know, the hardest thing to do is to love Hitler or to li love 9-11 or something like that. That's not the hardest thing to love. The hardest thing to love is your own self-hatreds. It's all the things that you yourself don't love yourself for, that you've been carrying with you your whole life. When you don't love your physical appearance, when you don't like your boobs, or your stomach, or your dick, or your height, or your hair, or lack thereof, or you don't like some disease you have, some ailment that you have, you don't like your weight, you don't like your posture, you don't like whatever about you you don't like, you don't like the fact that you're introverted, or that you're shy, or you don't like the fact that you've been mean to people in the past, or you don't like the fact that you cheated on your taxes, or you don't like the fact that you stole something from somebody, you stole some paper clips from your boss or whatever you did. That's the hardest thing for you to love. You see. So God will ping you with that. How does God ping you with, with that? By loving you. All you have to do is realize that All those things about you, that long laundry list of stuff about you that you don't love, God loves all of it. So that's the ping. When you realize that, That's what transforms you. Because when you feel that love, and you feel how accepting it is, and how forgiving it is of all of your evil and all of your sins that's the thing that kills you that's what transforms you that's what breaks your heart wide open that's what gets you to surrender that's what humbles you that's what heals you. And so I discovered, incidentally, in this process, what healing is. Healing is, of course, just love. Truth and love, to be precise. So, this is a, an aside here for you. The aside is, if there's somebody 
who you know that needs healing, whether physical or psychological or spiritual, whoever it is, a friend, a family member, or a stranger, a child of yours, a spouse, a mother, a father, a sibling, or of course your own self. If there's anybody you know that is dysfunctional, that is suffering, that is sick, that is in need of healing, it's really simple. It's really fucking simple. What they need is love. What you need is love. And truth. Not lies and pleasantries. Not some sappy emotions. But the acceptance of reality as it is. That's love. I'm not talking about some sappy, you know, postcard or something. I'm talking about a radical acceptance of reality, of truth. Truth is love. Because truth is what is, and love is the acceptance of what is. Love is. And the reason, ultimately, at the highest, deepest, most abstract level, the reason why you're sick, in whatever ways that you are sick, whether physical, psychological, or spiritual, is because you lack love. If you're addicted to drugs, it's because you lack love. If you're a dysfunctional, neurotic person who's anxious all the time, it's because you lack love. If you're needy and shy with people, it's because you lack love. If you're a people pleaser, it's because you lack love. If you get into fights and arguments with your family all the time, it's because that relationship lacks love and you lack the capacity to love the other in that situation, and they, the same with you. If you have political rivals who make you angry and upset, because you lack love for them. If you're insecure about your looks, you lack love. If you're overweight, and you have physical health problems because you lack love, because you mistreat your body. You don't love your body. You don't pay attention to your body. You feed it the wrong things. You use it in the wrong ways. You fill it with poisons and chemicals. And then you wonder why it doesn't work well for you, why you don't feel well. And then even as it's sick and as it's dysfunctional and as it's toxic, you, you, you love it even less now. You see, it becomes a downward spiral of not love. And in this way, you get lost and you don't know how to turn this around. The solution in all these situations is opening yourself up to truth and to love. This is challenging, this is difficult, this is one of the last things you want to do because chances are that the reason you're so dysfunctional in the first place is because your life is predicated upon a bunch of lies. The foundation of your life is filled with lies and deceit and manipulation and selfishness. And so when your life is predicated upon that, you don't want truth. The one thing that will heal you is giving up all your lies, but that's the last thing you want to give up. Which is why you don't want to do spiritual work. You don't want to investigate very deeply. You don't want to contemplate anything. And you certainly don't want to take psychedelics. And you certainly don't want to take 5-MeO-DMT. Because all of that will reveal all of your foundation of lies. And are you ready to handle that?
Are you ready to love all your all of your lies? See? That's what really grows you. That's what true transformation of a human being entails. And you know, dysfunctional children grow up to be dysfunctional adults because why? They didn't receive enough love from their mother, father, siblings, other kids at schools, teachers, mentors, adults. That's that's the basic reason why we have such dysfunctional adults who turn into murderers and rapists and dictators and uh, thieves, con artists, and so forth. Why? Why do people become these things? They didn't receive the, lo the right love. And it's precisely that love which they are lacking, which they then go out and then do selfish and wicked things to receive. So if, if some, somebody was lacking the financial security, then they go out and they become a thief or a con artist, stealing money from people because they need that so badly because they lacked it. Or if somebody becomes a sexual abuser, why is that? Because they didn't get the kind of love they wanted from their parents when they were younger. Or because for whatever reasons, maybe they, they had a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend that, that treated them badly. And so they didn't get the kind of love they wanted from them. So now they have to go out there and get it through some sort of illicit means, harming others. It's just that simple. See, because if you were filled with love truly, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go out there and do wicked stuff. You would realize that love is the greatest and only worthwhile thing in life, and so you would just exude love, radiate love. But you're so disconnected from your own love, you love yourself so little that you're not able to radiate love. You're rather like a, like a black hole sucking in love. But God is not a black hole. God is like a white hole, just radiating love all the time. So anyways, we're sort of in this, in this uh, contest, pinging each other back and forth. And uh, uh, the love got so deep that for the first time in my life, I, I really apologized. For the first time in my life, I said, I'm sorry. I realized in that instant that I, I never, ever really, whenever I said I'm sorry, I, I never really meant it until now. And the reason I said I'm sorry is <laughs> I just said I'm so, I'm I'm sorry for not loving more. <laughs> That's the only thing you have to be sorry about. That's really the only thing you have to regret about your life, is that you were blind to the love, and you were so selfish that you, you were just so blind to it that you didn't love enough. That's it. You didn't love your parents enough, you didn't love your friends enough, didn't love the people at school enough, you didn't love your colleagues enough, you didn't love situations enough, you didn't love yourself enough. You didn't love political rivals enough. So, so I went through this period of, of, of just really, really saying I'm sorry. Who was I saying it to? Well, to myself, of course, and to God. But the really amazing thing is that God's love is such that it doesn't force you to love. There's no forcing. If there was forcing, it wouldn't be love. It's just, I give you love and I want nothing from you. 
you see. And that only makes my love stronger. So, when you realize for the first time that the only thing you have sorry to be sorry about is not loving yourself more, you will instinctively just want to say, oh, I was so fucking stupid. How could I be so fucking stupid? How could I be so selfish as to not love myself more? And then God will, God will make you aware by basically telling you in one form or another that it's okay. I accept you as you are. You don't need to love yourself more. I even accept the fact that you hate yourself. I accept the fact that you weren't strong enough to love. I accept the fact that you're limited and that you're weak and that you're petty, that you're selfish, that you're ignorant. I accept all that and I love it. And I don't need you to change at all. So you see, it's not that God is loving you in such a way as to trick you to change yourself and to improve yourself. No, that's not love. That's bullshit. Real love means I really love you as you are. And I don't need anything from you. And especially all those things that you think I want you to change about you, I don't need you to change. I can accept them all exactly as they are. Because that's love. And I am love. <laughs> and when you realize that, That's what transforms you. <laughs> because in this process, God is not just telling you that I love you. These words are cheap. God is demonstrating it. And it's the demonstration of it that transforms you. Because once you get over that, you get over yourself, and you get over hating and judging yourself for not loving more, you get past saying, I'm sorry. And then, and this was my second huge epiphany, is for the first time in my life, I said, thank you. I realized that I've said thank you thousands of times in my life, but it was all perfunctory. It was all just mindless thank you. To truly say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for love. <laughs> you say thank you to God for love. This is the point at which you've really been touched by God's love. And at this point, you realize that that's it. That's the point. That's the only lesson in life. That's my only job is to love. Everything else is fucking idiocy. And then what you do is you say, I love you.
for the first time in your life, you say I love you and you mean it. Because you really understand what that phrase means. And you fall in love with God. But it doesn't end there. <sighs> Even as you do all that, God still loves you more. You're still nowhere, anywhere near to matching and reflecting God's love. As you do all this, God showers you more with love. And you're, 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 you're baffled by how much deeper it gets. You thought you got to the end. This is just the beginning. God showers you with love. And God helps you to expand your capacity to love, not just yourself, but now going beyond yourself. And now we're getting into the lesson of radiating love. See, you couldn't radiate love. God had to fill you with love so that it really touched you to the core. When it touches you to the core, now you start to radiate it yourself because you see that now you're full, or at least a little bit full, and now you're able to radiate. So now you start to radiate it, but now God radiates alongside you. So now what it turns into is a sort of a contest for who can radiate love more. Because you got God over here, you got you over here still. There's still the duality, of course. Um, but this is a training process, like I said, right? Eventually, we're going to merge. But before we merge, it's still a duality. So God, for example, now shows you how much it loves terrorism. And now that is a invitation to see whether you can love it too or whether you're going to resist and balk at it and shrivel back down into hatred and judgment and criticism. So God sort of shows you how much it's able to love, and then you can show God how much you're able to love. And this is the training process. See? And so, again, a sort of a contest happens. This sort of laser beam is bouncing back and forth between these mirrors, and now it's all about how much can you love. But no matter how, no matter how much you're able to love whatever God throws out there for you, it loves it more. And it throws something out there like a it throws you a curveball, and you're like, "Wait, ah, oh, fuck, I can't love that." And then you realize, like, "Yeah, of course I can love that. Why wouldn't I love that? Of course I can love it. Of course I can love torture. Of course I can love rape. Of course I can love murder. Of course I can love dictators. Of course I can love terrorists. I can fucking love it all." And then as, as you say all that, God throws you another curveball. It'll bring up something in your, in your past. That time that you were molested. Can you love the molester who molested you? It'll throw that out there. And then you'll say, oh, fuck, I can't. No, I fucking hate that. I can't love that. I can't accept that. Then God will throw something else out there. How about that time that somebody stole, stole your car? Can you love the, the person who stole your car? And you're like, oh fuck, I hate that guy. Or how about how about how about your mom or your brother when they said something nasty and 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 mean to you that stuck with you for 20 years? It's ruined your whole fucking life. It's ruined your whole self-esteem. It's made you hate yourself. It's made you want to kill yourself, made you depressed for years. Can you love that? And you're like, oh fuck, I can't. How can I fucking love that? <laughs> but as it fills you, as it shows you, because you see it throws it out there, but at the same time as it throws it out there, it, it itself loves it. But as it throws it out there, it's gentle. So it throws it out there, but then you say, oh fuck, I can't love it. And then God, what God will say in return is, it's okay. I love you. I love 
that you are not capable of love. I love that. And when that hits you, that's what fills you with enough love to overcome your resistance to love even that next level thing that you couldn't love. And so this race, this race escalates and it just turns into this, I love you, I love that more and more and more. Until eventually you're, you're, you're literally dying in love. You find yourself at a point where you, your physical body is dissolving into love. And you're losing, you're losing contact with reality. And you're drowning in this love. And it's so, it's so profound and deep. It starts to go and it, it runs into all directions. You start to, your mind starts to race through, through all of human history all of that stuff and you you start to love it and accept it and you're struggling with it as well and then it really <laughs> takes it up a notch where now it tests you in the following way sure it's nice to just be able to love stuff that happened to you in the in the past and to love bad people and get over some bullying that happened in the past eh, okay that's all easy stuff now it opens up you to the to the possibility of actually living through it are you willing to actually be raped are you willing to actually be tortured spanish inquisition style are you willing to actually be in the world trade centers when they're hit Are you willing to be a terrorist? Are you willing to live through Hitler's life? Are you willing to put a gun in your mouth and shoot yourself? Are you willing to go into hell? Are you willing to live through hell? Are you willing to suffer in the streets of a slum? Are you willing to die of a drug overdose? Are you willing to actually incarnate into that life and live through the worst hell you could possibly imagine? Not as a hypothetical, theoretical, something that might happen someday, but are you willing to live through it right now? And of course, you probably don't. <laughs> you probably don't want to. Right? But you realize that God would. Because God is love. And it's at this point that I just said, fuck. Just hold me, hold, because I, like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. You literally will, will yearn to be held like a baby in its mother's arms as you're realizing what love is. You don't want it to go there. You thought you were at the end of love. You thought you learned everything already. And now the real love begins. The actual physical incarnation of love. Just rifling through your memories and past trauma and experiences. This is, this is, this is mental imagery, basically. That's all it is. It's just memories. Imagine actually sitting there and being tortured in some CIA prison camp. That's real love. If you're willing to incarnate into that and to experience it. And that's when you realize how 
<laughs> that's what you real that's when you realize what what God's love really is. See, because God isn't just interested in rifling through your memories or just thinking about stuff. God actually incarnates. It's fucking here. This is it. When you see some murder on the TV, you know, being reported, fucking God lived through that. And the only reason it lived through that is because it loved it. So you're not willing to go there, are you? If you did, who would you become and where would you be? What would be left of your life? Would you still be a human? If you were able to love as much as God, what would happen is that this duality would completely merge and you would literally become God. So the only thing separating you from God is simply your capacity to love, which is just a function of how selfless you are. The only reason you're not able to love is because you have selfish biases and attachments. So are you willing to surrender all of those, including your life, your current life? And so then it went even deeper. And I started to realize what pure, absolute love is. So it got to the point where this sort of bouncing back and forth kind of subsided. I kind of understood where things were going. And then I started to like think about, well, wait a minute. What is, so what is reality then? What, what is reality then? And then God started to show me that what reality really is, is it's not any of this stuff that's here. It's infinite consciousness. Infinite formless consciousness. So what happened was that my mind in my visual field as I was in that bathtub, my, my mind and my visual field sort of just focused in on empty space. And I just sort of like zoomed into that empty space. And I realized that that empty space is just love. And I sort of just... I probed it deeper, like, what is reality? What is reality? Tell me what reality is. And I started just going deeper and deeper into that, into that empty space. And, uh, and it felt like my entire peripheral vision field sort of, sort of, sort of started to like narrow down and sort of collapse, or maybe it just sort of became irrelevant as I sort of zoomed into this. And what I started to experience here is just, um, the ultimate pinnacle of what reality is. And I just kept, I kept contemplating it and questioning it. Like give me, I want to fully understand the ultimate essence of what reality is. What is reality really? Like no fucking around. What is it? And my consciousness just started to become more and more omniscient and infinitely interconnected and it's sort of it the best analogy i would have for you is if you have a light bulb and you have a dial and you just start cranking up this dial on that light bulb and it starts brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter just pure white light and you're cranking this thing and it just keeps cranking and cranking and cranking whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter and it's just becoming more and more and more conscious and it's just turning into a complete singularity of consciousness and i just kept wondering what is reality what is reality? What is everything? What is all of this stuff? And it just kept getting pure consciousness, just infinitely more interconnected, infinitely subdividing more and more and more. Imagine if we took a single dot and we drew a line, one line from that dot in this direction, and then one line in this direction, and one line in this direction, and every line we branched out from that dot itself 
then each branch got another branch, another branch, another branch. And each of those branches got a branch, a branch, a branch. And they're just branching off like this. And so this is sort of what's happening. It's pure consciousness that's subdividing itself. And it keeps happening and happening and happening such that every new branch, as soon as a new branch spawns, it doesn't even grow a little millimeter. It already spawns an infinite number of new branches. And each one of those branches spawns an infinite number of new branches instantly. And each one is just spawning infinite branches in infinite directions at all times. And it's just becoming more and more and more conscious. This dial is getting cranked up. This light bulb is just becoming whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. And you think at some point that it's become pure white. Like this. Pure white. And then you realize there's no such thing as pure white. It's just the middle. Every point you get to is just the middle. There is no end. There is no beginning. And you keep cranking that dial and it becomes more and more and more infinitely interconnected, more infinitely conscious, more omniscient, more self-understanding, and everything is completely understood. It becomes so conscious that all form disappears and it's just a pure conscious singularity of love. And then I, I, I ask God, no, it can't be. Because I'm as this is happening, this gradually happens to me. It's gradually ramping up. The dial is cranking up. And I'm already intuiting where it's leading to. And I'm just like, no, it can't. It fucking can't. You're kidding me. It just can't be. It can't. And God is like, yes, it is. It can. I'm like, no, it's not possible. It's like, yes, it is. Of course. What, what else would it be? Like, no, it's not love. Of course it's love. No, it can't be love. Of course it's love. What else would it be? Why would it be anything else? No, oh my God, it can't be love. You're kidding me. No, no, it can't be love. Of course it's love. What else could it be? It's love. No, oh my God, this is impossible. Of course it's love. How could it, how could it be anything else? How could I be so stupid as to think it's anything else? And God is like, of course it's love. And then, and then the fear comes. Because then what you realize is that this is the end. This is the end of your life. You're dead. If you go any further, you're dead. Everything will disappear. Your family, your friends, your parents, all of it is completely imaginary. And if you stop imagining it right now, it will all end. If you go any further into this singularity, you will become pure, formless, infinite love forever, loving itself forever. And the entire universe will be destroyed as if it never existed. Complete nothingness, complete everythingness, you will merge into everyone. Your mother, your father, your children, your spouse, Hitler, terrorists, 9-11, Donald Trump, rape, murder, torture, everything will become pure, infinite love, merging completely into itself. There will be no distinction between absolutely anything, and that will be the end. And you will realize what reality is. Infinite consciousness, love, God. And you will realize that everything in your life, from your birth to this point, has just been some imaginary story, a dream, that was designed to lead you to pure, absolute, infinite love. And you will rest in that love forever. Forever falling in love with yourself. Forever making love to yourself. Forever in infinite union with every possible object that could ever exist. Pure, absolute, omnipotent, omniscient, perfect, intelligent consciousness. Everything 
that could ever possibly be is you. And that is awakening. When you are this awake, you're dead. And you have no desire for life. There is no physical existence. There is no universe. Nothing remains. Your parents and your spouse and your children they don't stay back and keep living their life, enjoying their life without you while your body drops dead. No, 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 no. This is much more serious than that. If you do this, if you become infinite love, you will take everybody with you. There will not be anybody left. You will destroy the entire universe Every single sentient being will become you. They will have no existence whatsoever. Zero. They will die with you. They will all awaken with you. It's infinite awakening. It's completely absolute. There will not be anything left. You will take the entire universe with you. Into pure oneness. That's awakening. And I didn't go there. As you can tell, since I'm still sitting here, I'm not there. I was too afraid to go there. And God was fine with it. It didn't push me. But that's not the end of the story. It's still just the beginning. This really had me shook because I felt at this point that I had a preview of where all of this is going now. Now I fully understand what awakening is. It's not anything I had imagined it to be previously. I understood how ser the seriousness of it, the gravity of it really hit me. And I started to worry just about sort of petty issues like... Um, What's going to happen if I just go there, you know? <laughs> What's going to happen? How, how, you know, if I drop dead from this, how much suffering will my mom be in? How much suffering will my brother be in? How much suffering will my ex-girlfriend be in when, they, when she finds out? How much suffering will you guys be in when you find out? But then, of course, I realize, wait a minute, there won't be any suffering because I'm taking you all with me. That will be the end. There will not be any suffering. The suffering is imaginary. But nevertheless, the imagination is so strong that it's still very tempting to be concerned about the suffering of others, especially what one's own death would, would uh, what effect that would have on the suffering of others. And so basically, I sort of I was shown this possibility of what they call Maha Samadhi. I suppose you could call it that. Maha Samadhi is the ultimate Samadhi where you become so conscious that you actually leave your physical body, you actually die. Uh, yogis have, have been doing this in India and other places for, for millennia. Um, so I got a, a kind of a preview of what that might entail, what that might look like. But also I got shook by it. Uh, I got shook by it. I, I got I got I got sort of terrified by it, especially because, and I don't get terrified that much by trips anymore. But this this terrified me because it it felt so final, like this. It felt like this is a decision to to just completely transcend all of 
all of physical existence. And that would be the end forever. <laughs> um, one part of me wanted to do it. The other part of me didn't want to do it because I still have attachments and things I want to accomplish here in the world. I still want to teach. But then, of course, I also realized who is there to teach? There's no one to teach. And there's no way to teach this to anybody. Nobody will ever understand the level of consciousness that I realized unless they themselves go there, at which point they don't need me anymore because I am them and you are me. So um, it gets quite twisted and strange loopy like that. But anyways, um, the what scared me is that like I really wanted to do it. Almost like... Um, you know, they say that the scary part of standing on a ledge of a tall building, it's not worrying that, that you'll fall off. It's actually the fear that you might want to jump off, they say. Um, yeah, so it's like that. There was the fear that I might actually want to do this. And I basically I said, I can't do it. At least not now, not until I like make final preparations. And so I literally went and started to make final preparations uh, because what it felt like is it felt like it didn't just feel like I want to do it. It felt like I had to do it. I felt like a sort of obligation because my whole, the whole thrust of my life has been understanding and truth. And here it is now I've been shown the absolute truth, the ultimate truth, and yet I'm resisting it. And it's sort of like God is beckoning me to come, come and merge fully with God. And like, on the one hand, I want to, but on the other hand, it's like, wait a minute, but if I do, then that's just nothingness. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> and so there was this, this thing. And so I, I said, basically like, fuck, I gotta like, I want to think about, I don't want to make any rash decisions. I want to think this through. Let me, uh, I'm going to, I have to make, I, I, there's no way I'm doing this without making some final goodbye, saying some final goodbyes, making some final preparations. Let me tell my, my family, I love them. Let me tell my girlfriend I love her and such. Um, like maybe let me like shoot one video or something <laughs> for you guys so that you just don't like read in the news one day that Leo fucking was found dead or something in his bathtub. Um, so, but on the other hand, like it makes no fucking difference. It would make no difference because I would be love and it would make no difference. And I would be you. I would be completely merged into you. It would make absolutely no difference. But, you know, the human part of me wanted to make some of these preparations. So I actually went and made these preparations. I told my mom I loved her. I told my brother I loved her. I loved him. Um, of course, this freaked them out a little bit. Um, told my ex-girlfriend I love her. Um, and, uh, and then... By this point, what happened is I stopped taking 5-MeO. The, the experiences got so profound and so deep by the, this was roughly maybe the 25th or 27th day of this whole 30 day process. I swore off 5-MeO-DMT and I said, okay, I'm not doing any more of this shit. It's enough. And the reason I said that is because the next morning I woke up and usually 5-MeO, it lasts for an hour, two most, three at most passes. Then you basically go back to your sort of normal state. Um, I woke up the next morning and I was still experiencing this infinite consciousness. Uh, you know, a milder version of it, of course, but still. And I felt it sort of sucking me deeper and deeper into that singularity. And I felt it beckoning me. And it felt sort of irresistible. But also terrifying. And at this point, I started like, I'm like, oh, this is, this is cool. I've never had it last this long before. Because I'm, I'm not on 5MEO anymore. Uh, and it lasted for like a whole 24 hours. And every time that I would go to sleep, I would get just like sucked into this infinite singularity of love. But I was also resisting it at the same time. Because when it sucks you in, it doesn't, it doesn't have an end to it. It keeps sucking you and sucking you forever. You might think like, oh, well, you just get sucked into it and then you're kind of in this one state. No, it, it's, it's infinite. It's endless. It keeps sucking you in deeper and deeper and deeper. And so um, it kept sucking me in, but I was still sort of resisting it because I said, you know, I want to say some goodbyes and so forth, make some preparations. And so uh, after about 24 hours of this, I, I started to, to worry 
it felt like I was sort of on the brink of getting sucked into the singularity, and I didn't really know how to stop it. And every time I would sleep, especially, it would really get strong, and it would suck me in really deep. And I would wake up just, like, sweaty and, like, in a panic um, because I was tripping deeper in my sleep than I was when I was just in my bathtub. And, and then what happened was that there, there began about a five-day period where I, I couldn't basically sleep. I was only sleeping for maybe one or two hours at a time, but I was taking maybe three or four sleeps per day. And ultimately, I was just sort of in this dazed, terrified state where every time I would take a nap, even for a short while, it would just like, I would be pummeled with even deeper insights, even deeper awakenings and getting sucked even deeper into the singularity. And it just kept happening day after day after day. And at this point, I wasn't taking 5-MeO anymore. I, I swore it off forever. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I just want to go back to normal. This is getting this is getting freaky now. I'm kind of in over my head. But it kept sucking me in deeper and deeper and deeper. I kept having, having deeper and deeper awakenings. You might wonder, well, what? how could it be any deeper? <laughs> And yet it kept getting deeper. And then one night I woke up just completely just drenched in sweat. Um, couldn't sleep. Just totally, just totally terrified. And I just went and I kind of sat in the corner with a blanket and just like dozed off a little bit. And as I dozed off, what happened was that I had an even bigger awakening. <laughs> where I realized that every single awakening I've had up until that point was just like a point on a single one-dimensional line. And it was just one dimension of awakening. Everything I've set up to this point was just a single dimension of awakening. And then what I broke through to is a second dimension. A second dimension of awakening opened up. This second dimension is completely unimaginable, completely undescribable, cannot be talked about, cannot be thought about, and yet it's there. In it are things that are completely outside of the physical universe that you can't fucking conceive or imagine. Um, and then, of course, what you start to realize is that if there's two dim dimensions of, of this, there must be a third dimension, and you discover a third dimension. And then you realize if there's a third, there's a fourth. If there's a fourth, there's a fifth. If there's a fifth, there's a sixth. And so it goes. And each one of those can be explored. I barely even ex began to explore the second dimension of awakening. But what I realized is that it, <laughs> it goes forever. And so this freaked me out even more. I struggled with it some more for a few more days couldn't sleep, resisted it, had emotional upheaval of all sorts, and had no idea what was going to happen to me. I was, I was totally certain that this Maha Samadhi was just going to like fucking happen one, one minute and then I'd be gone. Um, and so that happened for about five days. And then after that, it subsided. It gradually subsided. I was able to sleep again. And I came back to normal. And uh, I've been working to make sense of all this and to integrate all this for the last couple of weeks. So that's what happened. <laughs> Believe it or not. Crazy, crazy, crazy experiments in consciousness. Make of it what you will. I'm not going to make claims here about who has achieved this, who hasn't. Can you stabilize in it permanently or not? Is Mahasamadhi really possible or is it just a temporary thing? What will happen after you do Mahasamadhi? Do you just stay there forever or maybe you reincarnate back or go to some new dimension? I don't know. I don't have the answer to these things. 
Um, the whole process has, has really humbled me. It's opened up my eyes. It's made me question every enlightened teacher and master that I've ever studied under or communicated with. It's made me question how deeply do they really understand reality. It's left me with lots of insights, memories. Um, right now, I'm sort of back into my ordinary state, but uh, transformed, more loving, more understanding. Um, still frustrated, you know. One of the biggest frustrations is how how what do you what do you do after this? How do you how do you how do you reach those levels of consciousness naturally in the sober state how do you make it permanent you see the thing is is that people who say that oh well but leo it wasn't permanent so it's not real but what you understand is that the, the distinction between permanent and impermanent is complete bullshit there's no difference between permanent and impermanent that's your own imposition consciousness doesn't care if it's permanent or impermanent you could have full infinite God consciousness for one second. And it's genuine. It's exactly what it is. It's infinite God consciousness. It's absolute consciousness. Infinite omniscience for one second. Then it's gone. That doesn't mean it wasn't real. It just means it was there and now it's not there. You were fully awake. Now you're half asleep. That's what it means. Can you be that awake all the time? Maybe, I don't know. What does it take to become that awake? Meditation, yoga, self-inquiry, more five of me, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's not possible at all in the human body. Maybe you have to put a gun in your mouth and shoot yourself. I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities. So there's a lot of lessons from this that I'll be teaching. I've still only scratched the surface of all the lessons that I learned in this 30-day retreat. I'll be creating more videos in the future if I'm still here <laughs> and if I'm still teaching. Um, I've had to really reevaluate and reassess even not just how I teach or what I teach, but whether I should even teach. Because who am I teaching? I'm... I'm there's nobody to teach since I'm only teaching myself. When I'm fully awake, there is no you. There are no unenlightened people for me to, to, to awaken. There's only my own awakening. That's all there is. When you awaken, if you do, you will realize that I'm just you. And so is everybody else. And that there is no Buddha and no Christ and other enlightened masters. There's only you. Either you are awake or you're not. And of course, there's many degrees of how awake you can be. But, but at the highest degrees, it's all just you, baby. <laughs> there's nobody else but you. So I will be teaching in the future probably um, more of these various lessons and insights that I learned here, guiding you more. Um, probably my style will change a little bit. Hopefully it becomes a little more authentic, more genuine, more compassionate, more loving, deeper, less games. I want to play less games, more teaching you how to love. I would say my biggest, if I had to boil all of this down, my biggest, biggest single insight from this uh, 30 days and the thing that I want you to remember for the rest of your life is the answer to the question of what is reality? Do you really want to understand what reality is? Do you want a definitive answer to what reality is? There's only one word for it, and the word is love. That's it. Reality is love. That's the highest thing that I've realized. I think that's the highest thing you can realize. And if you ever go as deep as I've gone, uh, 
I look forward to being there the moment you realize it. Because when you realize that you're love, you'll realize that you're me. And you'll realize that you, as me, years ago, which is right now, told you that reality is love. And that that seed which was planted right now finally blossomed and bloomed and gave fruit many years later when you finally realized what I meant. And of course, what you realized is that I was you telling you that you are love. And that there is no such thing as Leo. There never was a Leo. Leo is just something you imagined as a vehicle to tell you that you're love because you were so separated from your own self and from the world and from Leo that you created Leo and you believed in Leo as though Leo was real and separate from you and not just a figment of your own imagination because you were too afraid to realize that you are singular, infinite love. And that you needed this convoluted, contorted process, this game of hide and seek and separation. You needed this because you weren't fully ready to accept the oneness that you are. And it took you years. It took you your entire lifetime. It took you precisely every single step in your life from the moment you were born to the moment that you realize reality is love. It took you all of that. Everything was necessary precisely to lead you to realizing that everything is love. And that's what life is. Life is exactly those steps which are necessary for you to awaken to love. What else would it be? Why would God bother to make anything else but love? All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me if you would. Come check out my website. Check out the blog. I do, I'm do. i posting new stuff on the blog, videos and exclusive content. So check that out. Um, I have a political video I recently posted. I think it's pretty good that analyzes the Bernie Sanders loss and uh, gives some insights to progressives from a meta perspective. Come check out the forum. Come ask me questions on the forum. I answer them. Check out the Life Purpose course if you're interested in some practical advice for how to get your career and life purpose into shape. And... Uh, Support me on Patreon if you like. I appreciate that. Helps me to do the research that I do. You know, like taking taking a month or two off is really, really helpful for me to go deeper into this work. And then I, I love then reciprocating that back to you guys. So I'm not just like vacationing. You know, I'm not just taking this time off to go to go to Hawaii or someplace. Um Usually I'm, I'm, I'm exploring something deep when I take time off so that then I can, I can share deeper insights with you and, and teach better and be a more pure teacher. So that's that. <laughs> um, I just want to issue some warnings, I guess, here for the end, which is uh, be very, very careful not to turn the things I say into an ideology. Your mind is going to want to cling to these things and turn this into a sort of a map or a model of awakening. But the map and the model is not the territory, as they say. Um, I don't expect you or even want you to believe the things that I say, per se. Don't have faith in them. Um, I'm, I'm just sharing possibilities with you. If you're a curious, open-minded person, who's interested in understanding reality at the deepest levels, you want to access omniscience, 
You want to know what reality is? You want to know what truth is? You want to know what life is about and why you're here and why it's so crazy and why everything is the way that it is? If you're really curious about that, then that's what I offer you is I offer you ideas, tools, resources for how to, how to do that. I am not offering any kind of ideology here. This is not a belief system. This is not something you adopt. This path will be very individual for, for you guys, for each one of you. Um, so be very careful, you know, even, even the things that I say when I share my personal experiences, like in this episode, this not, this might not be how it unfolds for you. Even if you go and do 5-MeO-DMT, it might not work for you this way. You may not experience all the things that I experienced because, hey, you know, when I'm having my communications with God, it's communicating to me in exactly the ways that I need for me to awaken. So I have to go through what I'm going through. What you might have to go through is different because you have a different personality, you have a different genetics, you have different life experiences, different traumas, different emotional problems, and so forth. So, use the examples of my own journey just as examples. Don't let them constrain you to think like, oh, well, it has to now unfold for me like it did for Leo. No, 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 no. Not at all. It might unfold totally differently for you. For you, you may not need psychedelics. For you, you might not need 5-MeO-DMT. For you, you might just uh, achieve this through meditation or whatever. Uh, so be open to your path looking significantly different than mine. But overall, we're going to converge. We're going to agree on, you know, on, on many of these things. We're going to agree on infinite consciousness. We're going to agree on absolute truth. We're going to agree on God. We're going to agree on, on love and so forth. These things, no one really disputes these things. It's just like how you get there and what the process looks like to get there. And I guess the other thing I just want to stress to you is just be really, really open to questioning the depth of your awakening. Whatever awakening you think you've already had, just be open to the possibility that there's more. Wouldn't it be a shame for you to do all of this work and to get so far and to unravel all of this self-deception and to finally reach some amazing level of awakening only to miss one further level up from that. See? Now you might say, oh, Leo, but this is just chasing. You're, now you're indulging in spiritual chasing. How long are you going to chase? Are you going to keep chasing and chasing and chasing forever? When does it end? And the only thing I can tell you is that I don't know when it ends or where it ends. Maybe it has no end. And, uh, that means I chase forever, then I chase forever. Or maybe at some point I reach an end, then I reach an end, and I'm going to be there. But my journey is not done yet. I'm not satisfied yet. There's a lot more. My healing is still something I'm working on. It, it has not been completed. I still have those physical issues that I've talked about in the past, my energy and chronic fatigue and thyroid stuff. That's still a separate issue that I'm, I'm working on. Um, maybe I'll talk about that in a, in a separate video on, on my blog. Um, so don't get the idea that I like, I have reached the top and now I think I'm the best or something. No, it's, it's not that at all. It's just a question of how deeply do you really want to know what you are? If you get satisfied easily, then you're going to have a little awakening and then you're going to stop thinking that you've gotten to the end. So I just <laughs> want to leave you with that warning. All right, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.